It was the first day back for MPs today, but outside Westminster, something wasn't quite right. For the last few years, you could have come to College Green at pretty much any time and seen protesters lining this fence from both the pro-Remain and pro-Brexit sides shouting at the media. But today, something's changed. No one is heckling. It does feel like something has been resolved. For the Labour Party, though, this is just the beginning of a massive period of introspection. Today, the recriminations and blame game steps up a notch after Caroline Flint said this about Emily Thornbury yesterday. She said to one of my colleagues, um, I'm glad my constituents aren't as stupid as yours. The shadow foreign secretary threatened her with legal action. People can slag me off, yeah? As long as it's true, I'll take it on the chin. But they can't make up shit about me. Potential leaders are making up their minds to stand or not. The competition doesn't ask, uh, open until early next year. Can you rule yourself out, though? I've given you my answer to that question. And who will Jeremy Corbyn back? Good morning, how nice to see you. Here's the editor of Labour Lists, Sienna Rogers' take on the runners and riders. There is only one sort of true Corbynite in the race so far. Rebecca Long-Bailey really is the only one that people have considered to be proper, solid Jeremy Corbyn supporter. Angela Rayner is a little bit more to the soft left of the party. I think both of those candidates will have a very good chance, but I think there also is a lot of support for Keir Starmer and also for Lisa Nandy. It also is interesting that this race is going to be shaped by Brexit in a way that the last two leadership contests weren't. So someone like Clive Lewis, uh, who is very pro-EU and on the left of the Labour Party at the same time, will have that section of the party supporting him. But then on the other hand, someone like Lisa Nandy is identifying that the Brexit position might have been one of the problems for Labour in this election. So that's going to be at the centre of the debate as well. There could be other contenders too, like Jess Phillips and Emily Thornbury. Tonight, rumours that Angela Rayner will step aside for her friend and housemate Rebecca Long-Bailey. A man who has put up with more abuse and vilification than any other modern political leader, but who retains still the undiluted love of his party members. The Labour Party have been here before. In 1983, after a hammering, Michael Foote was asked a familiar question. Do you join those who feel then the that the policies of the party should not be amended or changed in no, any way? I'm not saying it should never be amended. It's got to be moulded. You can't throw a manifesto out a few weeks after an election and say we're not having any more of that. So if you look at Labour's history over time, everyone's looking at 1983 and thinking about how long it took them to get back into power until 1997, obviously they went through successive leaders, Neil Kinnock doing a lot to sort of tackle what they then saw as the sort of, the, you know, the problems of, of engaging with the left. And the other thing is you can look at what the Conservatives went through from 1997 as well, because parties in opposition, they often go through sort of phases of trying to find that winning combination of, of both who's in, you know, leading the party and also sort of what's the policy platform. Stephen Kinnock, who happens to be Neil Kinnock's son, believes the historical comparisons work only up to a point. This is a different situation that we're in now, but the basic lessons remain unchanged since the foundation of the Labour Party, uh, and they are that you need radical policies, yes, but they have to be rooted in reality. They have to have just as much security at their heart as they do freedom, uh, just as much about aspiration uh, as they are about protecting uh, the most vulnerable in society. Many Labour MPs from all sides have told me the same thing. There were elements in Jeremy Corbyn's economic policies that shouldn't be binned. There's definitely some common ground. Officially, the leadership contest will get underway on the 7th of January, with the leader announced in spring. But make no mistake, this battle is already well underway. James Clayton there. Well, joining us now, the Labour MP for Ilford North, Wes Streeting, the former Labour MP Emma Dent Code, who lost a Kensington seat on Thursday to the Conservatives, and the Labour peer Lord Glassman. Welcome to you all. If I can start with you two, um, I think it's fair to say the decisions made now over the next couple of months will determine how quickly Labour becomes a, a, a credible political force again. So, Emma, could you give me one thing that you would ditch from what we've seen and where's you give me one thing that you would keep what worked and what didn't work emma what would you what's your takeaway that didn't work that didn't work um 
certainly the unity within the party was, was missing, and that's a huge shame, actually. We had a very, very good manifesto, which we should have been able to get behind, uh, but there were so many, you know, personality uh, clashes and so on, and that was very, very negative, and that was a huge shame. So it was the other people. <laughs> uh, well, no, I th I'm sure it was all of us, but um, it was a huge shame that that happened, just as, uh, you know, I, I was focusing very, very much on my patch, um, trying not to get too much involved in all the... Uh, the uh, personality clashes within Westminster because uh, Kensington's a, a very complex place. But Let me try uh, with you, Wes. What, what's the one thing that you would keep from that campaign? Well, a firm commitment to ending austerity and making sure we're reinvesting in our public services. I thought there were big ideas in the manifesto, um, reframing how we tackle the climate crisis as a green industrial re revolution, I thought was very smart. The work that Angela Rayner did on the National Education Service, particularly lifelong learning, speaks directly to me and one of my big passions mm. in politics. The problem during the election was that, taken together, the manifesto just wasn't believed by the voters. So I got comments on the doorsteps like, how are you going to pay for all this? How's this going to affect my family? How's this going to affect my business? It's a bit too good to too be true, isn't it? Too ideological then for people. I mean, do you think there was not enough common sense and there was too much idealism? I mean, everything had been costed and I did actually read the grey green papers, uh, the grey the gray document as well, so I could actually uh, back that up. And no other party did that. So, you know, I knew it had all been costed, everything that had been put Morris, forward. Morris, no, you, you predicted this. I mean, almost to a T. Um, you said said that this was going to be a defeat comparable to 1931. You wrote that three years ago. Where were the warning signs for you then? Well, it's been, first of all, a long-term trend that there's a disaffection from Labour from its base, from its heartlands, from working-class voters. That's been going on. And the whole issue of Brexit was a class issue. They, people voted for it, working-class people voted for it. And what they witnessed was Labour refusing to respect this democratic vote. So that was that was the basis of my prediction that unless we could actually have a Get positive... Get behind Brexit, in other words. Well, no, a positive vision of the break with neoliberalism because right. Maastricht and Lisbon put real constraints on state aid and real constraints on through the competition law. So Labour had a possibility to outline a genuine programme of national renewal. And I agree with Wes, what happened was a litany of things that, that, that we would do, but it didn't resonate because the trust had been broken. So how does this change what happens now? What is the shape of the leader for you? Do they have to be female? Do they have to be northern? Do they have to be um, a Brexiteer or Brexit voting? I think if we're, if we're going straight to that kind of reductive answer, then we haven't understood what voters have just told us, because I think what happened at this election, it wasn't just about the manifesto not being as, as good as some of its parts or the promises being far-fetched. Um, it, it was a rejection of Corbyn, of Corbynism. It was on the doorstep people being concerned about whether we would be strong on national security and defence or whether we'd side with terrorists or our country's enemies over our, our, over our own national security. Uh, economic credibility was a big problem and the culture of our party as well from our problems with anti-Semitism, which was obviously a big issue in a constituency like mine with the Jewish community, but more broadly the fact that we'd spent weeks in the run-up to the general election, staving off attempts to deselect so Labour MPs instead of focusing our far on the Tories. Who are the people that answer these problems now? Who are the people, the names in your mind, Emma? Um, I would rather look at the kind of person that we need. I mean, you know, the, the Conservative Party have told us for, you know, been braying at us for ages, oh, we've had two women Prime Ministers and you haven't had any. Actually, it's, it's the nature of the person, the two women Prime Ministers we've had. The Tories have been, the, you know, some of the, brought forward some of the worst anti-women policies. So actually, we need, we, it's, a, it's the character of the person and whether or not they, can, they are attractive in all kinds of ways. I mean, Does physically, anyone jump out at you, but, any of you? I think there are people that are credible both inside and outside the shadow cabinet. I think people inside a shadow cabinet are going to have a tough job because they've got to explain why they agreed to go into this disastrous election in the first place, why the party was so ill-prepared and how they will break with the things that re repelled the public. Backbenchers will find it slightly harder to get hearing, but then you've got people like Jess I mean, Phillips who are harder, quite exciting. Right? Much the... harder, but you've got people like Jess Phillips who are, are very exciting people and she's got a force of personality to 
bring herself into the debate. Someone like Lisa Nandy, who's incredibly thoughtful and will elevate the quality of the Labour leadership debate. So um, I'm sort of reassured by the sorts of names that are coming forward, but we've got to make sure that we're honest with ourselves. They're not just Labour MPs who've been knock knocking on doors, hundreds of thousands of party members slog their guts out to try and win the general election. They've got all this feedback too. So we've got to think about not just who uh, can answer the challenges facing the Labour Party, but what are the answers and what are these leadership but part candidates of this saying? This is actually structural, isn't it? The way that Labour chooses its leaders, you know, you have to be entwined in the NEC, and the NEC is made up of momentum and unite uh, funds, you know, the, the whole party. So if you're not coming from inside that Labour clique, essentially, you don't get I think, to I the mean, top. We, we really have to remember that, f that f four years ago, the, the Labour Party completely changed and there was a huge influx of membership. Whether that was down to one individual or his, or his policies or what it was, that completely changed. Our membership went up five times just in Kensington. It was but extraordinary. Doesn't, and so what does doesn't no decide how the electorate votes in the end. But membership will choose the leadership, so that is very important. So but the, is pe that the people who joined wrong? four years ago will be choosing the new leader. Morris. Um, the, I mean, the scale of this defeat requires i mean there's a labor may die it's lost its it's lost its home it's lost its heartlands it's become much more um, middle class you've also got as the previous piece said you've got an activist government is going to come in which is going to actually target the north and the midlands in terms of infrastructure in terms of investment mm. in terms of turning its back on neoliberal economics so what we what we need in, in, in terms of leadership is people who are prepared to recognise the scale of the defeat. This is the first thing. Mm. Because Labour's in danger of being completely irrelevant to the conversation. Right. I mean, the if it is the end of austerity, if it is investment in public services, if they are giving more money to local government and joining up the railways between towns, you know, like beaching, beaching, then, yeah. right, then what's your job? But yeah, but let, let's, before we get too carried away, I mean, I listened to the earlier discussion, something like radical redistribution of power as a former councillor, I would support that. But what we've seen from the Conservatives' time and again is distrib redistribution of power but without the resources to go with it. I'm slightly sceptical about how this parliament will pan out for the Conservatives, mm. about how they'll manage the economy, what happens if we have a recession off the back of Brexit. I think there are plenty of opportunities for a, a Labour opposition to get stuck in but we need credible leadership, we need exciting leadership, people who understand what's gone wrong and people who've got the strength and courage to put things right. Because as Morris said, this is our worst defeat since 1935. The worst thing we could do to the country now is to say this is business as usual after the kicking we've just received. Yeah, Thank I you all like very much say, indeed. Okay, something about Proof the off. construction industry. We cannot deliver the infrastructure we need because construction industry is almost on its knees. Uh, we don't have the skills, we don't have the power, and we don't have the investment. And that comes down to immigration, I suppose. Partly or, down to that. Or down yes. to. And, the, and, the, and Brexit. It's going to be um, hideous. I mean, the, the construction industry is bracing itself for a recession. Thank you all very much.